Good morning and welcome everyone to Bell Let's Talk Day. I would like to thank Bell Canada for their effort to raise awareness and combat the stigma surrounding mental illness in Canada. Bell is notably the single largest corporation committed to mental health in Canada. Thank you, Bell. I would now like to introduce our MP, Leah Taylor Roy, to say a few words to start today's event. Thank you so much, Monique, for that introduction. And thank you to the Board of Trade, as I said, for, for hosting this with um, Home on the Hill and to Kathy for setting this up as well. Um, and of course, to Bell for starting this dialogue many years ago and, and having us talk about mental health, which still remains um, somewhat of a stigma. And I think one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit this morning is just the, um, the issue of serious mental health or psychoses and um, you know, what it is and isn't. It's, it's, you know, it's not unusual to hear in, in common everyday vernacular someone say, this is making me crazy or I'm going crazy. And, and we kind of refer to that as um, our being stressed, our, being, our dealing with things and um, just you know, someone who's not acting in a normal, normal way. But um, the word really goes back and we don't use it accurately often. And, you know, we have to be more specific, especially when we're dealing with mental health. And I think that's one of the things that Home on the Hill has provided, is it provided really an understanding of mental health disease. You know, mental illness, like physical illness, it consists of many different diagnoses. And I'm talking to people who know that well, but I think it's important for us to think about um, you know, just we don't only talk about somebody with a physical problem as unwell or sickly. You know, we talk about what is wrong. And I think in mental health, especially with serious, serious mental health, it's important to do that. Um, and, and it's important not only in helping the person having that kind of dialogue and removing stigma, but also so that it gets the funding and the attention it needs. Um, and I think when we're talking about that, it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to turn your back on someone who is crazy. But if we're talking about different things like schizophrenia, dissociative identity disorder, or bipolar disorder, those, those are seen as diseases and should be, as well as depression and other more moderate forms of mental health disease that people live with. So, and people with mental health live with so many challenges that we need to be there to support them for. I think, um, you know, graduating school year um, when you're depressed can be difficult. Um, finding a job, building a career, um, dealing with talking about it because of the stigma can also be very difficult. And there's a lot of employment repercussions for people still. So we don't have those free discussions. But I think the most difficult part of mental health is the impact it has on relationships for us all. And that's why these conversations are so good. And that's why what Home on the Hill does is so important. You know, you're a unique um, mental health care provider, um, one that's much needed in the community. And I think that um, we all know that how family is, plays a large part, but also the stress and strain that um, having, living with someone with mental health challenges can have on family. And I think that support that you provide um, is critical. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, you know, I, um, I, some people, some people make, make, would call what Home on the Hill is trying to do as, as crazy. Um, yeah, that is crazy to try and do this in this world, but you have been doing it successfully. Um, and I think you're, um, you're to be admired for that. And, and I want to thank you very much. I just want to say that it, this is a problem that's not going to be solved by one person or any one level of government. It it's really starts with, with organizations like Home on the Hill at the level of the community, the, the city or the town working with it, and then our, our provincial and federal government supporting that. And so it's my pleasure now to introduce someone you know well, uh, your provincial member of parliament, um, Michael Parsa, who I know has been a great supporter of Home on the Hill for many more years than I have. And Michael, thank you for your support and your service. Um, and I want to turn it over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to see so many uh, friendly and familiar faces. Uh, you all know this, uh, the direct and indirect impacts of the pandemic have had serious effects on, on so many in our communities. And MP Taylor Roy just alluded to, to some of the areas. And, and, but especially those who, have, who were already uh, struggling with, with mental wellness. And uh, I know that really every level of government, I can tell you, and throughout the pandemic, I, I couldn't be more thankful for my colleagues at the federal level, at the municipal level, 
we've been working together uh, to allocate resources that really address the, the needs. And, and, and we know that more needs to be done uh, for us to be able to uh, continue to, to help the people and to be able to provide the supports and services that people rely on. Um, again, which is why it, it's important for us to expand the services that are available on this. And this is exactly what our government uh, at the provincial level uh, has and will continue to do. And I can tell you since the beginning of the pandemic and really well before it began, we have allocated hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in collaboration and support with, the, with, with our federal colleagues uh, to enhance and expand mental health and addiction services and supports for, uh, for people across the province. And I'd now like to introduce uh, our next speaker, Kathy Wernacki, who's not a stranger to anyone on this call, certainly, and is the president uh, for Home on the Hill and a sitting member of two councils, the Social Planning Council at the Affordable Housing Coalition of York Region. And I know that her presentation will go into detail on all the great work that she's done and continues to do here in our community. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for that very warm introduction. Um, I really do appreciate it. It's, it's not just me, it's the team at Home on the Hill that's doing this work. <laughs> um, and thank you so much to the Richmond Hill Board of Trade uh, for this wonderful um, opportunity for Home on the Hill to showcase our organization. Uh, we really do appreciate it very, very much, Monique. Home on the Hill was founded by the families uh, of people with serious mental illness living in the Richmond Hill community. We saw a profound need for supportive housing. And we, um, and so that's why we originally began. And we look forward to the 30,000 supportive housing units that the current provincial government has promised for Ontario over 10 years. When we began in 2011, we had hoped to receive federal funding, but we were told that there was no more money for housing at that time. So instead, we endeavored to serve the community in other ways. For example, we developed the Robert Velthier Lecture Series on Mental Illness to address the need for better mental health literacy and attracted well-known psychologists and psychiatrists to present at our lecture series held at the Richmond Hill Center for Performing Arts. We thought if people understood the symptoms of severe mental illness, then there would be less they would be less judgmental and more understanding. We also developed a very successful family support and respite program. And we also offered psychoeducational sessions and also information about financial planning. We also created the Home on the Hill Connections Program which gives individual and group support to our clients through recreational therapy and social work. We use a family model of care, which involves the client and family members who want to give their support to their loved one and will often go on social outings together. Most importantly, in the last year, we were able to develop our supportive housing program, which is located at the manse of the Richmond Hill United Church. We also have an apartment in Housing York at uh, the Richmond Hill Community Hub. In our supportive housing program, we families were able to incorporate our unique knowledge of severe mental illness, such as schizophrenia, into how we support our tenants. We know from seeing upfront the challenges that the symptoms of the illnesses cause, therefore we know how to best support our, our tenants. Uh, through ongoing supportive counseling, and ongoing recreational therapy to allow our tenants to keep well. We know about intrusive thoughts. We know when the mood changes. We know about paranoia. We also know about the symptom anosognosia, which is a lack of insight into the person realizing that they are ill and therefore uh, one of the barriers to them seeking help. The wealth of knowledge that families know could be a powerful resource to the formal mental health system. Also significantly, Home on the Hill has participated in focus groups with the planning department of Richmond Hill, again emphasizing the need for supportive housing for those living with mental illness in our community. 
we have taken part in two deputations before Richmond Hill Council to support the affordable housing strategy and very much look forward to working with the planning department to develop more supportive housing for those living with mental illness in our community. I'd like to thank you again uh, to the Richmond Hill Board of Trade. Thank you to, um, to the politicians that I've attended. Um, and thank you to all that are listening here and to our supporters. Uh, I will now pass the, uh, um, pass the meeting over to Maggie Valthier, our program administrator. Woman the Hill was started by parents who were frustrated by the lack of services for the seriously mentally ill. Mental health affects the whole family. So families are key to helping their adult children with illness because the kids are reticent to go out with, uh, for services that are available with strangers. They're very um, um, shy and, and need to know people before they take that plunge to get help. So by developing our family services first, we have given, we were given a view as to how the families and their unwell members are doing. We develop relationships with the whole family, and we, when we have events, we uh, invite parents and siblings to join in so that they are feeling more comfortable and more likely to connect with us. So by family members doing self-care and respite activities, they are more tolerant and patient with their loved ones. Our family worker also helps us navigate through the system so that the children who need these services can get the help they need. Maybe we could have a discussion about, um, uh, about mental illness and how we could, uh, con you know, how grateful we are to Bell. Um, to have this day in which we focus upon this, but how we could make the Bell Let's Talk Day uh, work 365 days a year so that we're not just um, concentrating on mental illness for one day, but that we, you know, we kind of um, promote the conversation so that we can talk about it more often. Yeah, Kathy, um, I would love to hear, um, I know I talked about all the programs and the money we're putting into this, but at a, at a, a person to person level, the work you do, especially with families and those that are dealing with um, living with serious mental illness. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear what you think can be done in terms of lessening stigma, any concrete actions that can be taken. Um, and like you say, not just today, you know, every day. Yeah, well, thank you so much for asking that question, Leah, because I do know we talk about stigma, but the most it's stigma is not the most severe problem. The most severe problem is getting adequate services for our loved ones with severe mental illness. That means having more um, longer hospital stays. We have we don't have enough hospital beds for our loved ones uh, to stay long enough to keep well. I myself have had to fight premature discharge because I knew my son was not stable. Um, you know, and he would just have. Um, uh, decompensated and come back into hospital. And this, of course, um, it causes um, more expense if you have to readmit him. So, so we have to have more hospital beds. We definitely have to have a more supportive housing so that when people come out of hospital, they can stay well in a supportive environment. We desperately need that. Uh, we need um, more uh, services in the community and we need to involve families. Families have been traditionally excluded from the conversation. Uh, and it's very, very unfortunate because we really are an incredible resource when you consider that we, you know, myself personally, I've lived with somebody with psychosis for many years, and I have a lot of knowledge, as families do, to share with the mainstream system. So the, so the problem is not necessarily stigma as much as the lack of real services, you know, that, so, that help people get well and stay well. That's the problem. And with people with severe mental illness, one of the symptoms is uh, anosognosia, which is the lack of insight into a person realizing they're well. So they will not go off and get um, service because they don't think they're, they're um, ill. So that's, and of course the family has to deal with that in isolation. So um, rather than stigma, I prefer to have more services that are appropriately geared to the most uh, severely mentally ill in our community. 
I'm on, you know, I get passionate about this, so I, I apologize. <laughs> Oh, well, never apologize for passion, Kathy. <laughs> never. <laughs> I think it's what makes makes progress happen. But yeah. that's that's really good to know because maybe it's not so much conversation to um, deal with stigma. Maybe it's conversation to make sure this stays a priority, that this stays something people are thinking about because, you know, days like this, people tune in and they start to talk about it and then we move on, you yeah. know, and, and perhaps it's just making this more part of the conversation in media, in social media, in in, in our community so that people don't ignore it. Because as you say, when, when people stay home or, 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 or are withdrawn in some ways, um, we don't, people don't see this, people don't understand the need. So I think perhaps it's just more talking, <laughs> let's talk, mm -hmm. but not so much for the stigma, but for the, the, the um, information and for the uh, kind of PR, if you will. Daisy, would you like to say anything? Uh, yes, uh, we, we see that mental health is so important to all of us, especially now with the pandemic. What we would like to, uh, which is why in just the, uh, uh, it's just the Monday that, uh, the past Monday that we had, uh, the our Monday Matters, we invited uh, specialists doctors uh, on mental health to come and share and support. We understand the challenges faced so many families. When I organized uh, and talked to some of these doctors, they say it is difficult to, to say one thing to support everybody. The best thing is nip it at the bud. Just so uh, if somebody is really starting to suffer and they don't even know, suffer from that mental stress and that will develop into terrible illness, that's the time that we should encourage them to talk to friends, to talk to the family doctors, and also find specialists to help them at that time. Okay, so what I'd like to say uh, to Daisy Way is we agree with you that getting help early is, is the right way to go. Unfortunately, it takes two years to see a psychiatrist. Yes, it's very hard. There is a wait list here in Richmond Hill to, uh, to see a psychiatrist. We actually, in our family support group, uh, supported an elderly gentleman whose son, the psychiatrist had, re had retired and the son had no psychiatrist and it took two years to find another one. So in our family support group, we, we supported uh, this gentleman uh, as he waited uh, with his son to get a psychiatrist. So the tension and the stress that that causes, the GP was, uh, she was supportive, but she uh, didn't have the confidence to uh, prescribe the right medications and know the right doses. So these are the kind of uh, situations that we deal with at Home in the Hill is supporting our families as they're waiting for service. You know, it's just a lot of it is the lack of available service, unfortunately. It's also uh, it's hard to get a psychiatrist. However, families are suffering, uh, and I have been there myself, where that uh, I have tried to get a form to to get my son to the hospital, and because he exhibits really well, he goes in the hospital for perhaps seventy two hours, and he comes out and it's back on our on families, trying to get them uh, the help they need. And my son has been hospitalized eight times. And each time, maybe he, he's been there one month, two weeks, he each time comes out and he's not stabilized. And it falls back on families to try to get the right help and the right resources. And it's taken me, I would say seven years to finally get the right help. And I, I'm very proactive, I'm in the field and I could not get the help I needed. No one listened to me because it was up to my son to get the help and he was too sick to get it. How did you finally get the help, Joni, if you don't mind me asking? I guess the last hospital, I found a doctor that would listen to me. I knew what medication he needed and I knew how sick he was. And um, I just advocated, I went to the head of the hospital, I went to patient advocate, um, and I just was relentless because this was the last time because I didn't know if he was going to make it. He was so sick. So finally, someone listened to me. 
There are so many different crises in mental illness. Like for example, when uh, a young person, psycho psychosis happens around late teens or early twenties. So when a young um, boy or man uh, gets ill, maybe around 23 and he's living with his parents and he's becoming ill, he maybe retire to the basement and the, the parents don't know what to do, you know? That's just one uh, example of a crisis. Another crisis could be where, um, uh, where somebody becomes very delusional and uh, you know, very involved in their obsessive thoughts to the point where they're, they're endangering themselves and they're endangering the people they live with. That's a second kind of crisis. There's all sorts of different crises. We can't have a one size fits all response to each crisis. And um, I think that, you know, I think that just talking about this is really important because it, you know, gets people on board and, and hopefully looking for solutions. As I sort of gave you the heads up earlier, uh, Lewis, our presenter, is not able to, so his mom is going to present for him. And um, uh, perhaps um, you can describe a little bit maybe about uh, Lewis before you start, Joni. So Lewis is now just had a birthday yesterday, 34 years old. Um, and he's sorry he can't be here today. And some days are good and some days aren't. And the last couple of days have been, um, he was struggling a bit and he felt uh, that he wasn't able to do it today. So he, um, so this is his story. He grew up in Richmond Hill in a very loving, warm family. And he had lots of friends, lots of girlfriends. He was a person that people just adored and he was like a magnetic. You know, he excelled in, in, in um, sports. Um, he was on a debating team in high school. He was on every sports, he was on every committee. And then he went away to university and Again, he excelled. He was on the debating team. He was on the business team. He was on the DECA team. He traveled all over Ontario debating um, and doing sports. And he finished a degree in business and um, then left to go to his dream job in Waterloo. And there he excelled as well. He was named at one of the top uh, 10 under 35 in his company. And um, he uh, was on the sports team. He was on a um, board of directors for Big Brothers and Big Sisters. He also was uh, traveling around the province for the company, trying to um, talk about the company and get students to move uh, to get employed with with the Manulife Financial. So he had everything. Um, he traveled with his friends. He had friends from high school, from university, uh, and from elementary school. Uh, and he found the love of his life. And he um, was he was moving. He was going back and forth from Toronto to Waterloo uh, because he found the woman of his dreams. He wanted to marry her and um, move in with her. And he had a great life. And during the time he. You know, he was eight years at um, as a senior financial analyst at Manulife Financial. And during that time, he had a terrific car accident where he nearly lost his life. And he was very lucky. He had, he he had a lot of um, pain, but it seemed to go away through physio. And then he went away to uh, on a trip with his brother to Thailand. And he came back with a very severe parasite and he took time off from work. And then all of a sudden he became someone that no one knew. And he'll even say, he even says, I don't even know what happened to me. All of a sudden he kept telling my other son and I, I have brain fog. And Jonathan had, uh, Jonathan Lewis had a very photographic memory. So he remembered everything. So that was kind of strange. And, but we really didn't think much about it. We figured, you know, was he taking drugs? Was he drinking alcohol? But he was a straight A athletic guy. And he said, no, no drugs, no alcohol. And we kind of let it go. And then all of a sudden he had to leave work because he had severe pain. And 
you know, he, he kept getting checked with a parasite. It seemed to get, he, he seemed to be rid of it. But his pain got so severe and we had no idea. We went to, he went to every pain clinic possible and they could not find anything. But during that time, his demeanor changed. He went from a very happy, athletic, lots of friends to someone who we didn't recognize and he didn't recognize himself. He kept saying, I feel so strange, but we had no idea. He kept talking about his, his um, pain. So he went to a number of doctors and he got involved in uh, yoga and spiritualism. And uh, he just became very, very strange. And he went to a psycho psychologist and the psychologist, I guess, scared him and said, you know, I don't like what's happening to you. He's, and he and the psychologist said, I want you to come in for an assessment. And at that time, we didn't know anything about this. He came home one night and said, I'm called a family meeting for Sunday. And I want to have the whole family come. He sat us down and said, I'm leaving. He was leaving the next day for uh, Thailand. I'm not Thailand, sorry, Bahamas. And he said, I've, I've, I've decided what I'm doing. I'm leaving to get myself better. And we had no idea this was happening. And we said, what time you're leaving? We figured we'd stay up all night to try to stop him. By that time, he looked like a hippie. He was wearing crazy clothes. He was going to different churches and, and spiritualism, trying to figure out who he uh, to get rid of the pain. And I guess at that time he had auditory hallucinations, which he was not telling us. Uh, he left the next day and on his way to the airport, he broke up with his girlfriend who had been very patient during all these changes. And he broke up with her and he was supposed to be moving in with her within two months and he proposing and living the rest of his life with her. And she was very, very patient. And she was, she was devastated. Um, and so were we, we had no idea what happened, what was going on. So we found out where he went and apparently he had planned this meticulously for a number of months where he had um, all his tent equipment and he had taken some training and he was going to live uh, in the Bahamas on a yoga retreat um, volunteering and living in a tent and living off the land. And this was not the person we knew. So we were concerned. And so we tried to find family and, and friends who knew anything about this resort. And it was a bit of a cult. So my son, my other son found somebody there who was going to, he was liaisoning with. And they, the resort said, or the the retreat said that he was changing. He was not. He was not changing his clothes. He was not doing his volunteer work. He was not um, participating in yoga. He was not eating or drinking, and he was seemed to be praying and um, being isolated. So my other son said, "Well, what can we do? Could he fly down there? Like we didn't want to just scare him because he would have maybe left." to go to another country. He was talking about India, apparently with my son. So what happened was uh, the, the resort said to him, we're concerned about you and we want you to see a doctor in, this, in the city. In the middle of the night, that night, he left, the, he left Bahamas and went to another island. My other son found him and he was going, he booked a trip to India. He was very, very sick then, and he had weighed maybe 90 pounds. He was 152 when he left, or 142. My other son booked a trip to uh, a one-way ticket home and met him at the airport. Um, this is very emotional. Um, anyways, he came, to our, he, he came to our house, and we did not know him. He was 90 pounds, praying, praying, and was wearing winter clothes. It was 100 degrees out. We said, you know what, let, let's, let's take a shower, change your clothes. He couldn't. He said, they won't let me. And we didn't know who he was talking about. 
So what happened next was we tried to get him to come downstairs and eat. And he ran out the door and we ran after him, but he was much faster than us. So my husband took the car and I went through the, um, the field. We have a ravine in the back of our house. So we went, I went through the ravine and lucky he was standing on the corner of Bayview, Bayview and 16th area in a in hundred degrees weather wearing winter clothes. And we were very lucky that when his friend came by and saw him and got him in and was able to get him in the car and his friend called us. His friend was very, he had a family member who had a mental health disorder and, and really understood what was going on. He told us to call the police and he was bringing him home. And he told us a little bit about what was going on. We called the police and unfortunately he's a very sweet guy and they handcuffed him, which was devastating and took him to the hospital. There he had his first psychotic episode. Um, he had left the country for five months. So we hadn't seen him in five months and he had totally changed. He hadn't shaved, shaved or his hair was long. He hadn't changed his clothes. He stopped eating and drinking. Um, we didn't know, it would look like he was like a Holocaust survivor. We didn't think he was gonna live another day. He went to the hospital and once he got medication in his system, he seemed to be getting better. And they, they asked for us to bring him to a day program every single day. But what we didn't realize was my son was very, very ill. He was still very psychotic and very and 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 was very um, unwell. He came home and we tried to get him to the day program and he couldn't go. He was too sick. From that time on, within four months later, he was back in the hospital. And I have to say, this time the hospital really understood and kept him in the hospital for one month. At that time. They said that he needed to be on an injection and the injection seemed to work, but they couldn't, they couldn't find a psychiatrist. So we had to find family and friends who could find a psychiatrist and we found someone. But unfortunately that doctor took him off the medication and, um, and uh, put him on um, medication that he had to take orally, which he was never compliant. From that time on, he deteriorated. He talked to angels. He had a dark force that guided him. The dark force, which I'm gonna to talk to you, I'm gonna read his words. Um, I've had psychosis for the last five years and it started at age 29. This is when I started having symptoms. I just wanted to keep in mind that it had changed and evolved over time. I had auditory hallucinations, which the voices were very distressing. They called themselves the dark elite. In the past, they used to tell me uh, to hurt myself and others for approximately six months. Thankfully, the voices had stopped and these command, uh, have stopped and these commands are no longer doing that to me for the last few years. I've had a lot to deal with. I realized that the voices were not my own and were coming from outside of me. I was very strong. Sometimes I wonder how I survived. They also fear, interfered in my everyday life, especially in activities which I enjoyed and loved participating in. For example, I would play golf and at the sixth hole, the voices would really get loud and put me in an alternate reality where I couldn't function anymore. I would have to leave the golf course as I physically couldn't play anymore. In addition, the voices made me catatonic several times which usually led to hospitalization. I couldn't take care of myself anymore. Canatonia is very scary and I don't wish it on anyone. When I was canatonic, I, I would stand in the same position for four days. I couldn't move, I couldn't eat, I couldn't drink and I couldn't go to the washroom. I, I was unable to communicate verbally. It's like my brain and my mouth had been separated. And during this time, the voices became really loud and put me into a psychotic state where I was in an alternate reality. I just want to make an important distinction. Please don't ever give up on your loved one in this state. They may appear to be a vegetable, but you're still there somewhere. 
like being trapped in a bubble where you are unaware of everything but still can't function. Lastly, the dark elite or the entity can take over my body, walking and speaking for me, basically taking over my motor skills. I will leave you with an example. I was waiting for the subway when all of a sudden I could feel the dark elite taking over my body. I started walking towards those subway tracks. As I got closer, I realized what was happening and I started to fight back. It was a struggle. I had to fight them from walking onto the subway tracks. Eventually I was lucky and able to take control and fight them. It was very scary. I'm lucky that I'm very strong. Most people would be dead by now. One last story is I want to tell you before I tell you how I got, how I'm getting well and how Home in the Hell has helped me. When I was in a very, very psychotic state and the dark elite was telling me what to do, I planned, a, I planned an escape uh, where my family and my doctors had no idea how sick I was. I planned to go to Thailand and I had a one-way ticket and, no, and $500, but I had a bag full of medication. It took me three months to go to 21 different pharmacies and hospitals and doctors to get my supply of medication, just in case they stopped me and my family was trying to find me, I had prepared to tell them I was taking my medication. Dark Elite helped me plan every move. I left the country my family did not know. Lucky, luckily for my family that a friend of my brother's called to say that he had lent um, a backpack to my brother, uh, to me and my brother called our family and we had a meeting and we had to call the, the, the RCMP. They found, they found me in Vancouver at the, at the airport. I was lucky that my flight was detained 72 hours. The police did not even, the police found all my medication and I convinced them that I was fine. I was lucky that my mother and the family and, and my doctor convinced them to hospitalize me. My family came to get me and uh, I was hospitalized again in, in Toronto. I worry that one day if they had, I would keep worrying that if they had not found me, what would have been my future? Would I have been, would they have found me and would I have been dead today? It's been very scary and traumatizing for me to think of those situations. I think it's a balance that you have to have many things in place to become well and stay well. For me, staying on medication, being on an ACT team, working out, eating right, sleeping right, having social supports and involved with Home on the Hill supportive housing has saved my life. My mom found out about the recreation program and coaxed me to meet Tracy. I was only willing to meet her individually and she really helped me open and become more social again. I was not open to my, uh, I was not open to my other friends about my mental health challenges. I feel so fortunate to have joined Home on the Hill organization. I've been a part of it for two years. They have provided me, uh, they have provided me for so much and have impacted my life and I'm thankful. We are a group of three guys and Tracy, who is a recreational therapist. We have gone out to do a lot of fun things like golf, tennis, basketball, working out, restaurants, raptors, and jay games. We, are we have grown close like a family. They've become my best friends and they are always available to me whenever I need support. We meet once a week as a group. Now the, the recreational therapist, Tracy, is always available and we text through the day and a week if we need to. I have found a sense of community, friendship, and support. This has helped me recover as, all, as we all struggle with our own mental health challenges. We are able to pick each other up each day when we're having a bad day or triggered. For instance, the other day was my birthday and we went out for dinner. Uh, uh, we picked up dinner and ate it at someone's house <clears throat> and uh, we were having dessert and I was getting triggered. And I asked my best friend, one of the other guys to take me home. I couldn't, I, I had to go, the voices were too bad. They said, sure, no problem. 
And it was not no big deal. I was very open and honest with them. So I have to say that they have really enhanced my recovery. They have the, their contributions and just being in my life greatly helped with my recovery and enhanced my quality of life. I'm proud to say that I've gained new, a new family that will always be there for me, where I can, I can be myself and not hide my illness. It has empowered me to become more resilient and to know I'm never alone. I now volunteer work at a crisis line at the Cransman Center two times a week. I share my experiences with others, but not with my close friends. I'm on the board of directors of Shoresh, a nonprofit organization. I'm training to be a public speaker for a nonprofit organization, which is the Mood Disorders, which is now called Hope in Me. I provide peer support in the community and I tell my story to other families and their, and their loved ones. In my closing remarks, I want to, I have many examples, but of interest of time, I want to leave you with these things. Never give up. I consider myself a psychosis survivor as too many people with this disease will take their own life. Trust me, I've been there before having distressing voices every day for five years, and it's been very difficult. But I am deter determined to beat this illness and help others. It is also important to tell the distinction where the voices are coming from and to recognize that these voices aren't your own and you shouldn't act upon these commands. And remember, for loved ones affected by this disease, never give up on them. They appear to be gone, unresponsive, or in a vegetable state, but they are still in there somewhere. You gotta get them help. Please try to be patient, as I feel so fortunate that I got my personality back and everyone that not everyone does. Lastly, I'm stable on medication. I've been out of the hospital two years. I never want to go back. The biggest difference now is that I still have psychosis, but I'm not psychotic. Thank you for listening to my story. Uh, that was very, very moving. Uh, I, I really have no words. Um, Monique, do you want to? Thank you very, very much. I'm sure we are all uh, shaken up, but the story really sheds light on how people are feeling and dealing with, um, with wellness, mental wellness. Um, is there any, um, we had a short question and answer if anybody wants to ask. Jo Joni, is it okay if people some of our guests would like to ask you questions. I think it's a lot to digest because if you haven't been there, um, it's overwhelming. I like for me, listening to the story, it's overwhelming because it's every day at a time, it's um, each day is a new, a new adventure. You never know what each day is going to bring. And um, so I just look at each day as a new day and a new adventure. And unfortunately, you know, John, John, um, Lewis Johnson is a very, very accomplished young man. And he hopes to go one day, get married and have his own children and work again in his own field. And um, he's unusual because it, he was 29 when this happened. It usually happens much earlier. And um, unfortunately, it's been a very, very long journey trying to get the, the right medication and the right doctor. And, and unfortunately, we're still not there yet, but we're trying. Okay, Joni, I have a question because I have a 20 year old. So, I mean, as you're talking, I'm thinking like, oh, just looking for signs with him or his friends and all of that. Do you think that there was a trigger or something that really um, started um, the psychosis? Well, that's interesting because he had no mental health issues growing up. We've gone through his history. We've looked with the doctor. There was nothing. And the only thing that we can find, we can think of is did something happen when he had that major car accident where he nearly passed, he nearly died. Or the, or the parasite, he, something did affect his, his brain or, and himself when he came back with that parasite. And then was it uh, the stress of his maybe relationship? Was he ready for it? Um, he was madly in love and to this day, he keeps hoping that he, he could get her back. 
but she's been with someone for a long time now. But you know, I have no idea. His his case is very different, and um, each person can't understand what what went wrong. We have no idea. He was great in school, great in athletics. He 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 had a he was life was was probably one of the was a fairy tale story. I mean, his he was one of the top um, rising stars in his company under 35. Um, they were sending him all over the world to talk and to develop programs and systems and whatever. So I have no idea. Um, could it have been from childbirth? I had a different, a difficult childbirth, perhaps that too. But we can't, we have no idea. But really look at the signs when your child is changing. Um, you know, are they doing something differently? Are they acting differently? Are they isolating? Um, are they, um, have they changed their friends? Um, there's all these little signs that, you know, people should look for. Uh, and, you know, perhaps when he was changing his clothes and changing his friends, um, he was an adult then, and we just thought he was searching for something different and new. We had no idea what was going on because one of the pro biggest problems was trying to get him help. And, in the, and, and unfortunately, even when he was psychotic or manic, he was able to pull it to himself together for an hour at a time when he went to a psychi psychiatrist or a hospital. And each time they let him go. And I'll never forget the last time when he was going to the hospital and he was on an ACT team. And I called the caseworker and I said, my son needs to go to the hospital, he's so sick. I was driving on College Street and he kept jumping out of my car and he nearly was killed multiple times. And I, I was calling my husband to come to call the police because I didn't know if I was going to survive because he kept grabbing the wheel and, and, and it was horrific. And it was finally that um, the caseworker said, oh, I had coffee with him. He was great. I said, he's going to be in the hospital by, Friday, by Saturday. You've got to get me help. So we had to call the head of the ACT team, the doctor and Cam Mage and said, if you don't put my son in the hospital, there'll be a legal case going on. He's so sick. And uh, his, 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 we went to his apartment and um, you know, his stove was on, it was, it was the, the, the pot was smoking. Um, we were able to get him in, but it was hard. It took us five years to get him help. I just want to respond. Um, I am so touched by what you have shared. Julie, you're very brave. You're very courageous. You're a great example for many. And I also, we care about you and make sure that you take care of yourself as well. We will work together as a community. And I thank Kathy for working and Home on the Hill has support your son. But uh, I will relate your situation to, to Michael. Michael. Michael Perry is a very good friend of mine and I'll tell him and ask him. And I am thankful that Kathy knows him as well. And I am happy that he can continue to share with the group. And I know that there are a lot of seminars that he is uh, hosting. So anyway, I'll, I'll connect and I'll get back to you. I Thank you. And Daisy, I work a okay. lot with a colleague from the Hong Fok Mental um, Health Association. And uh, we, we have joint... Um, clients that we work together with and um, we do seminars together. I just want to say um, to everybody that, uh, and thank you so much, Jody. Um, I think you described your family situation so well, uh, but the examples that Joni uh, has described, many family members, many family caregivers experience these, um, these situations. I mean, I have been actually, on the 401 with my son when he was psychotic and he was grabbing the wheel. Um, and um, I think that there's many times when our, our safety uh, is in danger. Actually, he was, um, he was uh, accepted at CAMH immediately after that, thank goodness. Um, but 
I, we're all walking around, all of us mothers, mainly mothers, but also dads, we're all walking around as, um, as people that are on the front line that see uh, what it's like uh, to have an untreated mental illness. We're the ones that have to deal with it. It's, uh, I remember the first time I called the police, it was like, it was just, um, I just felt differently afterwards. Um, you know, when you have to call the police for a fan, for somebody that you love. Um, so I think that what Joni has done is she sort of opened, um, hopefully, the conversation about untreated mental illness, the fact that families are dealing with this on a daily basis. I mean, my son now lives, luckily, thankfully, in our supportive housing program, but he's on the phone uh, quite often and he visits quite often. So he's still in the picture and he will be until the day I die. So, but it's the same with many of us. We, you know, we, we experience so much. It impacts on our own mental health and it also impacts on our physical health. So we're trying, you know, we're caught Costing the healthcare system in indirect ways, um, you know, because um, we really do need to have more adequate services for those with serious mental illness, so that there isn't this ripple effect um, where we're all the whole family is affected. I, I think it's so so true, and um, I was thinking as Joni was talking that each of the members of our family support group have similar stories to tell and how many of the family members actually suffer from post-traumatic stress because they've never had any experience of having their kids become strangers to them. And it's, it's so scary. And, you know, it's hard to um, let other people know how, what it's like. And that's why the support group is so important because the families feel so isolated because nobody wants to hear about it. You know, it's, it's so scary that they, they say, okay, you know what? I don't want to know, <laughs> you know? So the family feels more isolated. So the family support piece is so important to get the family stabilized and then to help the, the, the person who's ill get treatment. It's so true. I mean, I have to say, I probably suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome and I was in the field before, but in a different area of bereavement and abuse. Um, and, you know, mental health crosses over, but I had never been experienced. And I remember when I found someone who understood, they said to me, take away all the knives in your house and get locks on your doors. And I'm thinking, are they crazy? What are they telling me? Well, thank God I listened to them because one day I came home and my son was going had a knife and I said, what are you doing with that knife? And he said, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with it. And at that point I said, oh my God, I, and I got locks on my doors, I hid my knives and um, I felt safe. And when I tell people that they said, oh, that will never happen to me. And I have to relate stories after stories of what happen has happened to families. And some of the outcomes are not good. So it's a scary, it's scary for the individual with the mental health illness, and it is scary for the families. We live in fear each and every day of what might happen to our loved ones and ourselves. Thank you all for joining us. Um, it has really been enlightening, and I've learned a lot of um, stuff. Like, honestly, I've never been to a bell, um, one of these Bell Talk events. So um, it, it's, it, it's really, really an eye opener for me. So with no further ado, uh, MPP Daisy Way, could you um, send us all back to our work? Uh, thank you very much, Juanita. I just want to say I'm so touched. I lost my words. I have so much respect and uh, appreciation for all the mothers and from Kathy on Home on the Hill for those who are facing challenges from your loved ones. Um, yes, we are in a community. We are going to work on this together. And it is great that we have this kind of conversation that the community can get together to support each other. And I totally agree with what Joni and what um, uh, Kathy has said. 
having what we call a group of people sharing, supporting each other, that itself is a healing for the family members who are supporting the loved ones. And I thank you all for willing to share what you're going through today. And I don't want us to stop here. I would definitely be in touch with uh, Joni and with Kathy. And I try to relate it back to Michael. I am not, uh, I'm not in the medical field, but we can find somebody who can work together with us and help us. And otherwise, having a pat on the shoulders, I give you a virtual hug right now. <laughs> you know, something like this. It will be supportive and helping the community, each one of us. And I just want to say at this point, thank you very much for having me today. It is a very important day. And I thank you that Bell is uh, encouraging us to speak up and speak out. And definitely I'd like to thank Monique, Mohammed, Lisa, Lucy, and the rest of the Richmond Hill Board of Trade team. And definitely Kathy, the Home on the Hill has done a lot. We hear the witnessing, the testimony, Please continue with the good work. We will do our best to support the community. We understand that just now I was saying about the pandemic, um, what you were relating is somebody who is already getting more serious into the problem. But I am also sensing and seeing that this is a growing challenge in the community. Let's work on this and nip it at the bud. And I think just talking and also making sure that they see the family doctor or making sure that their awareness that they're having, aware that they are having such a, um, a stress, it already support their needs. And I also want to, to know that, of course, uh, the provincial government should be doing a lot more things, but we did do a lot already. Um, but we know this is a growing need, um, our province, uh, the government knows that this is so difficult for all the families and where you have been, and which is why we have included a minister, minister for mental health, even way before the pandemic, as I was explaining. And especially with the pandemic, we have put in 194 million additional to support those in pandemic. But I know we need to do more for those of you who have been suffering with loved ones like what Joni has just shared. Uh, what I will do is I'll definitely leave this to Michael and ask for his suggestion. And in fact, just to be honest, I was just setting up a meeting between Michael and Dr. Yang um, to meet up with uh, Minister Tobolo just to see how we can work together. So hopefully this is going to support me and stimulate me to do something that is beneficial to the community. I can only do so much, but I do love and care all of you. Let me tell me how I can and what I can do. And I appreciate Kathy, you say you're going to relate it, uh, discuss things with me and I will do the best I can together with Michael, uh, Dr. Michael Perry. Um, Anyway, I just thank all of you to be here today and we will continue to uh, work on this as a community. And um, today you have really put something very important in my heart and I will uh, make a commitment to do my best to support the group. Thank you very much. Thank you, MPP Daisy. And thank you for being here and not attending your, your audit commitments. We appreciate it. Okay. I'd also like to thank our um, director of the Board of Trade, Cheryl Guinness, who um, had introduced uh, Kathy and I and to actually pull this event off today. So thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay. All right. So thank you, everyone, for attending. And um, if there is no further questions, we are going to end our event today but continue the conversation.